Okay, thank you. Uh, right, well, I think we'll, we will begin. Can I ask you all to um, just check that your cell phones are on silent or off? Uh, because they don't exist in the era which we are visit. <laughs> um, okay, so welcome to this one o'clock panel, uh, which has been retitled actually from the title in the program and is now called Steampunk, It's All Your Fault. <laughs> um, my name is John Berlein. Um, this is kind of cool to experience my ultimate fanboy moment in public. Um, I kind of feel like I'm about to witness a Beatles concert, so if I get a bit kind of, you know, squealing, do cool me down. Um, <coughs> this is a, a very cool and, and rare occasion. We, we have with us um, really the progenitors of the steampunk movement. Uh, I'm hoping none of these guys did any introduction, but I will do the courtesy. Um, on my far right, we have uh, K.W. Gita, uh, author of Infernal Devices and More Than Night, and, gonna, and many other books. I'm going to restrict this to the Steampunk books. Uh, Jim Blaylock, author of Homunculus, um, Lord Kelvin's Machine, and numerous uh, shorter works in the um, oeuvre. And, uh, on my left, Tim Powers, uh, author of The Anubis Gates. Um, so, I kind of wanted to start this panel by, uh, it's kind of documented all these guys were friends and students together. Um, and I just want to go back to your kind of college days and ask you what was going on around that time that obviously led you to start thinking about writing uh, the books that gave birth to this, this movement. Um, I can find out with EKW first of all, and then we'll bring the other guys in. Um, back when uh, Tim and Joe and I were all uh, students at uh, Cal State Fullerton, uh, I wasn't an English major, but I believe what uh, Tim and Jim were, but uh, I sort of hung out with the, with the English department people quite a lot. And there was really a, a, a very wonderful instructor at Cal State Fullerton, then a woman named uh, uh, Dorothea de France, or Dorothea Kinney, actually. Um, and she ran a little uh, organization, remember the, uh, the Poetry Society? Yeah. And it was mainly, uh, you know, going out to you know, her house and, uh, you know, drinking as much beer as you could, as fast as you could, while you listened to uh, horrible uh, poetry being read by, uh, you know, people who didn't know how terrible they were. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, for, for people like Tim and Joe and myself, there was a tremendous uh, impulse to uh, uh, sort of uh, set ourselves uh, aside from that and, and either terribly satirize it, which is what Tim and Jim used to do with their uh, William Ashless uh, stuff. Uh, but also, I think um, at that, this was, you know, the uh, late 60s, very early 70s. There, there was quite a, a, a push on for sort of mm, uh, sort of dissing or disregarding uh, old stodgy you know uh, uh, works and you know things like uh, you know, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson or you know uh, any of the any of the old school uh, thriller writers and I think uh, we were all such contrarians that just to piss people off, we would, you know, do a lot of, you know, uh, reading of that ourselves and, and show a lot of enthusiasm for it. Which of course meant that, you know, we never got invited anywhere <laughs> or got to do anything cool because it's a, those are the guys who are still reading those books uh, and uh, they still like that stuff. And so uh, uh, there was a, a certain, um, I, I guess, kind of pissy attitude uh, at least on my part, maybe these guys it was different, but um, it, it, it was way of really getting under people's skins by saying, well, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not so much interested in what you're reading, I'm interested in, in this, you know, crazy old stuff. And uh, for some, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, before we even began writing sort of our takes on that material, obviously it was preceded by a, a, an interest in, in, in the real thing. And, uh, I mean, to this day, I mean, I, I realize I've kind of set myself up as a one-man 
uh, uh, or led an anti-defamation society, uh, you know, defending the guy. And I, I think it's that attitude that, that was the real progenitor of, of, of our starting to write things in, in that vein, that we had a tremendous uh, respect and enthusiasm for material at that time that nobody was really in, into that much. Yeah, that was certainly true of me. I spent most of my time <clears throat> reading and rereading the Pickwick Papers and Nicholas Nickleby. And I went on a long binge during which I read almost nothing but pirate novels. <laughs> it turns out there's not a lot of good ones out there. Seen any of them. It was spectacular. And um, I reread Treasure Island over and over and then got on to uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And at the same time, I, I was reading piles and piles of P.G. Woodhouse, um, a short one, rereading it. And I thought, gee whiz, I, I just want to take all of this wonderful stuff and um, imagine that uh, if I were living in 1875, and this is the sort of thing that I would write, uh, I had no notion of writing historical novels or anything like that. I just sort of wanted to play in that era and see if I could fake some of the language and that sort of thing. You know, if there's 10,000 people in this room at all. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. It uh, came from having a taste for things like H. Ryder Haggard uh, and, and Robert Louis Stevenson. And I liked it uh, because I, I, I like writing in this because I always loved like Fritz Leiber's stories about Lankmar uh, or uh, Mervyn Peak, Gorman Gast, and you think uh, I want to write that kind of stuff with the mazy alleyways and the uh, you know mysterious lights and towers and stuff like that. Um, but I figured out that if I use an imaginary country like Lankmar uh, or even Arkham, I'm going to have to use a lot of imagination to come up with a world. And so I figured, wait, if you set it in the actual London and uh, <coughs> simply get all your cool details from research books, which Jeter luckily found the cornerstone research book for Victorian London, which is Mayhew's London Labor and London Poor, I figured you don't have to have any intrinsic imagination. You simply, you simply have to read all the research books and find the cool bits. And, uh, and there's something, I always worry about readers suspending their disbelief. And if you say, one day in Middle Earth or Lankmar, you've almost said, this is, let's pretend. But if you say, London, the Thames, uh, it sort of has a, you're, you're borrowing a sort of aura of credibility. And so, uh, yeah, I, I think I mainly um, fixed on it because it did permit you to not have any imagination of your own. No, I, I think Kim's very correct about mentioning Henry Major's uh, London Labor and the London Poor. I believe there were times when we, we all had a copy of it yeah. and we would sit around O'Hara's Yes, uh, a little bar uh, down in the city of Orange, and we'd go through sections of it, and somebody would say, "Dibs, yes, I'm doing that. <laughs> yeah. I got that." Can you and, and, and here we do some and, uh, and, and Jim, to my oh god, he beat me to the best part. <laughs> the, the bit about the, 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 the tanning industry in Victorian London. He just uh, tells a little bit. Of, some people may not be familiar with what the book is. Oh, it's a very oh, particular oh, kind of thing. Hen Henry Mayhew was a a, a, a Victorian uh, researcher. Uh, who went around studying uh, Victorian workers and, and Victorian poor and making a huge chronicle of how they made their living, uh, what they did to get by, and all this sort of stuff. And he would have huge charts and numbers of exactly how many violent <coughs> sellers there were in London. Uh, and, and of course, all the numbers were completely made up. They're, they're virtually, the numbers are virtually worthless. But uh, he loved them anyway and did fill up the page. Uh, and, but he would have these amazing descriptions of how people got by in those times. And there was this one section about the tanning, the leather tanning industry being entirely dependent upon scavenging dog poop. That part never appealed to me. Uh, it, it, it appealed greatly to both me and Jim. But Jim, Jim you used to the end. Which, which book did you use it? Uh, 
probably put it into homunculus. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. But you know, naturally, you know, those being the Victorian days, they, they didn't refer to it, you know, as poo. Uh, they referred to it as pure. Right. And so you had pure collectors, and they would just essentially go around the streets of London, scavenging dog poop and taking it over to the the tanning factories. And then these master tanners, you know, would be able to tell the quality of the leather by actually chewing on it and tasting how much dog poop they were using to, to tan the leather. And, you know, I told the same story up in Seattle at SteamCon, and everybody loved it there, too. <laughs> There's something about this, this factor of Victorian life that amazingly interesting. Yeah, you did work all day on it and get an, enough to buy a, a little piece of bread. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Enough gin, probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so however bad your job is, you're not going to be 12 hours a day like a dog would. Yeah. You know, if, if they call that, maybe you know, we have finally reached that stage where we're they call that pure. You wonder what they say in words like dirty before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing about Mayhew, which I wonder uh, must have had an effect, is that um, he, he was essentially a documentary maker um, and was able to um, become interviewed with various members of yeah. London well, society. Oh, yeah. And he wrote down faithfully every yes. single idiom, linguistic yes. idiom. So uh, it, it's very interesting for source material for Stephen because it really is a game to like listen to these characters. So it vividly brings these characters to life. Yeah, he, he, yeah, and he was a very good transcriber, in, in, in as much as he didn't try to do phonetic transcription. It, you know, he, he, he would use the actual sort of words, but not try to get weird little, you know, phonemes and things in there. So, yeah, I, I mean, uh, latching on to uh, Mayhew's uh, London Labor and the London Poor, I mean, it, it's as if a little time machine appeared in front of us that had just about big enough to have a little portal that you could open and peer through it into this sort of uh, Victorian landscape. It, it was, a, a, I think, a revelation for us. I, was, I, I loved uh, Mayhew's London Underworld. Yeah. He would interview, uh, let's say, uh, somebody who stole uh, land off of roofs, for example, and asked how much money he, he could make, uh, how he lived, how he got up to the top of the roof to, yeah. to tear the yeah. lead off, etc. It's just everything you need to know is right there if that's what you want for your book. Yeah, so there's, there's some guy out there interviewing copper thieves about the same thing. Oh, way. absolutely. Yeah. And we didn't near use it up. I oh, mean, no. it's still in print in two volumes, and uh, there's still enough gorgeous raw material in those two volumes for dozens of books. It's actually on the internet. You can just download it. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but that would be wrong. <laughs> He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are all kind of sat around being reactionary and trying to uh, you know, annoy your various colleagues at college, and then there's a bit of a step then to sit down and try and uh, start to fashion stories in this, uh, in this, uh, this particular ilk. Um, Jim, I think you are. Through your, your story, is it um, the Eight Box Affair that is regarded as really the first steampunk story? Because right? it precedes the novel that came out, is that right? Yeah, I think, I think it preceded the novel in terms of publication because it was quicker to get the short story in print. I don't know that it preceded the novels in terms of what was written for it. We're all working on the same sorts of stuff at the same time. Yeah, I think it started really with. Um, Roger Elwood. Yeah, I was about to say. Uh, Roger Elwood. Back in about 75, Roger Elwood, who some of you might remember putting anthologies together, he told Jeter and I, um, there's this British company that really wants to have a series of 10 novels about King Arthur reincarnated throughout history. King Arthur in World War II chopping open Nazi tanks with Excalibur and stuff like that. King Arthur helping out Wyatt Earp. Yeah. And Jeter and I were, that's a, you, you, you think these books write themselves. <laughs> Jeter and I were very young, and we said, oh, God. we said, golly, yes. It's hardly a excuse for being as stupid as we were. Right? And so we got together with Ray Nelson, who was the other guy supposed to be writing these ten novels, and we divvied up history. And uh, I got... Uh, 1529, I wanted a different date, uh, which had to do with the Siege of Malta. Yeah. But that was too close to something Ray Nelson had, King Arthur being incarnated at a later time. And Jeter told me, well, write about the Siege of Vienna. I, I, I said, but Jeter, you had a book you were going to loan me about the Siege of Malta. I don't have a book about the Siege of Vienna. <laughs> and Jeter said, probably there are some. Uh, <laughs> But 
the important thing was that <coughs> Jeter picked Victorian London. And at the time I was jealous, but it resulted in More Like Night, which kind of was like a compass showing the direction for how this could be done. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the upshot was that we were so, so naive back in those days, we actually wrote uh, the first books without a contract. Yes. Just, just, you know, Roger Elwood, because you could trust Roger Elwood. That's right. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, we never had, and, and, and wrote the first books in the series, and, and, and Elwood got back to us and said, you know, uh, they, they actually didn't go through the project. Uh, yeah. so, sorry sorry that you went ahead and wrote your own, your, but you get to keep the books and you can do whatever you want. So. And, and at that point, Jeter and I and Ray Nelson, having each written a couple of these King Arthur reincarnated books, looked at each other and thought, any day now, editors are going to be sick of King Arthur reincarnated throughout history. Yeah. I'm going to get mine to editors before you get yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, right. so, so you don't have Donald Wolbach and all these other guys going, what is the thing with King Arthur? <laughs> Tim and KW were going to be rich before I was. Oh, that's and, uh, right. So I sent in a, an outline to Roger Elwood that involved uh, William Blake and George III, who was going nuts because somebody was giving him poison snuff. And uh, I got a rejection letter back from Elwood, who said that it was pretty apparent that I was making fun of this part. <laughs> <laughs> Sent back and possibly by little robots 
And, um, and they're, they're wonderful, but you wouldn't buy real estate there. Yeah. You know? It's yeah. just a, the neighborhood's just gone down the tubes and <laughs> <laughs> you know, in German and Tim and I would you know go over different uh, you know plots that were coming up with books and stuff like that. And uh, there was one time at O'Hara's where, where Jim started, you know, telling the, the plot of the story he was going to write, where essentially a black hole in space was going to be filled in with a, a plug saw from Home Depot or you know, we're, we're both just, with even our limited scientific knowledge, just staring amazed at you. Know, like, that, that is either the worst idea we've ever heard, or very easily the best idea. <laughs> yeah, so, so, scientific knowledge uh, is, 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 a, is a fungible thing. I actually recall that a little bit differently. <laughs> I think we were talking about so we call right. involved, I, think. I, I believe that you said, yeah. gee, Jim, you would probably write this story by having them go in the whole thing, fits all sizes court. And I said, I, I stopped and I thought, oh my God, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I was simply asking you, can I have that idea? Yeah. Yeah. Keep it up, it was very yeah, generous. Yeah. 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 I wrote that story too. I sold it to Star Wind Magazine for 40 bucks. <laughs> and then they, they immediately went broke. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's a perfect area. Um, our weird Victorian sort of uh, London for misunderstood science and I think misunderstood geography. Like, I think you had actually been to London. Oh, at that point. Yeah. Jeter and I had never been. Uh, and in some ways, I think it was a help to um, be working from ignorance. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I actually got a review of Moral Night like where somebody said, you know, Jeter's extensive research in the byways and alleys of London is really apparent in this novel. It, it, it certainly is. Uh, yeah, we weren't hampered by knowledge. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, we're not hampered by knowledge. We've never been hampered by knowledge. Uh, but later on, uh, before I wrote um, uh, uh, Infernal Devices, I did go to London a, a couple of times. And in some ways, for me, that was the, the real inspiration of what I started doing. Uh, because I remember I was staying in a, uh, in a hospital in Earl's Court, and I would walk by a shop, I think uh, on the edge of Covent Garden, that specialized in old Victorian and Edwardian scientific apparatus that you could buy as collectibles. Uh, and there, there was this you know, beautiful shop, with this huge shop and a store window, and it was just filled with the most amazing things, all of which were completely incomprehensible to me. But they were gleaming brass and beautiful uh, uh, tripods and things like this, and uh, they, 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 they just, you know, evoked such an image of, of hand craftsmanship and crazy enthusiasms, and, you know, that was the forefront of science. I mean, you could actually have it right there. You didn't need, you know, a, 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 a collider apparatus the size of Bakersfield, you know, to, 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 to do basic, basic research. And I just, I, I can still see that, that store window in Covent Garden with, with all these gleaming Victorian apparatus, and I think uh, for me that's uh, where I started uh, getting a, a little more serious about it. Yeah, what year was that? Roughly '85. Probably, yeah, it would have been. Because no, no, it, I, when, when I went and saw it, was was, was earlier than that. But, okay, because uh, that is a core element of what steampunk is now. Those gleaming yeah, brass and yeah, wood yeah, instruments. Yeah, uh, and you know, uh, you go to any of the the, the, the steampunk conventions or things like that, you know, it's obvious that they're really into, you know, the brass work aspects of it. Yeah, uh, I think much more important than whatever the instrument was supposed to do <laughs> oh, is yeah. how, 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 how cool it was. Those calibrations. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, modern scientific equipment just looks uh, so uh, so dull by, by comparison. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, it blows up nicer, but, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and the, the, the whole uh, sort of steampunk design aesthetic it's at the far pole from, say, the Apple, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, Steve Jobs' study, where everything is sort of smooth, white, featureless, almost looks like, you know, sort of, well, I'm not a fan of that school of design. I always say it looks like a wad of mucus. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, 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 yeah, the way, yeah, yeah. <laughs> neither science or poetry, you know, big is big. Uh, but um, the, 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 the hand craftsmanship, the, the notion of something building something, and it's all 
sort of knobby and craggy and things poking out of it is sort of the polar opposite of that. And, and in, in some ways, there's a lot of people who just find that much more attractive. Yeah, yeah. And little leather cases with oh, brass yeah. corners. Yeah, yeah. And you yeah. flip the let, lid up, and there's little lenses in velvet uh, indentations. All like this stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jim, what about your impressions of London when you met Sven? And also, um, on from that, some of your steampunk stories go actually beyond London into the wider <coughs> kind of British countryside and Morgan Bay. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, and I, the first time I went to London, I think it was 1975, <coughs> yes, 75 or 76. And um, I anticipated that London would be the London of Charles Dickens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it turned out it was not, but it also turned out that at that time, if you went looking for the ghost of Charles Dickens, you could find him there still. Um, when I went back more recently, I found the ghost of uh, Colonel Sanders everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Um, yeah, I found that I, I didn't actually, as I wrote, wrote more steampunk, I didn't want to necessarily stay in London, necessarily. It's easier to, uh, to plot something and the characters run around uh, in a <coughs> sort of broader canvas. And um, what about you, Tim, because you, you've been to, you, your first trip to London was rather more recently than the other two times. Like about a year ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it was interesting to see areas that I'd written about. Uh, <laughs> it's nothing much bigger in real life. I'm <laughs> sort of Lego uh, size. Um, but uh, in a way, it's just something separate. I'm still writing about Landmark. Uh, and did it, did it in any way disappoint? Or was it, uh, did it work it overlaying what you saw against what you imagined? Uh, uh, no, actually. Uh, it, it, I think it's always the case with any colorful city like New Orleans or San Francisco or London that uh, when you see it for the first time, you're dazzled. Uh, but the people who've lived there forever say, oh, you should have been here 100 years ago. It's all worthless now. <laughs> uh, but no, we were dazzled, wandering around, you know. Uh, Every, every other building has a blue plaque on the wall because someone, you know, Milton lived yeah. there, Chaucer threw a party there. Uh, I, I live around within two minutes of my front door is uh, Henry Mayfield's blue plaque. <laughs> yeah, um, so uh, as a matter of fact, I have now written a book since then, which takes place in London in Victorian times, um, which I figure it's not my fault, the research kind of indicated it, but it's um, the first thing I've done with actually some first-hand acquaintance in London. Um, I always like to think that you don't need that. You don't need actual hands-on experience. You can write about Berlin, say, and get along just fine with National Geographics and picture books and guide books. Um, but like I have to say, my the old London I was writing about in like the Anubis Gates, I was kind of imaginary one. You never saw a glimpse of that? <clears throat> I gotta say no. Somehow cars. <laughs> cars. Uh, <laughs> although actually, and I wouldn't say this if I thought it was going to go any further, but um, <laughs> <laughs> Anubis Gates is a complete fake as, silent, or as steampunk because it has no steam, uh, there's no tech, no technology, and it does not take place in Victorian times. Can uh, you, get, what are you doing here? It's well, no, I don't know. It's, it's, it's not these people will keep that to themselves. <laughs> uh, we, we really must talk about the coining of the, the term, um, KW. I don't need to tell the story, I shall not to so. Oh, well, yeah, if you're, if you're, in, in some ways, you know, you know, I, I have a dubious, dubious privilege of being able to document that I coined the word steampunk because, you know, you know the, the documentation is there in a letter I wrote to uh, Locust Magazine. And really, the, the, uh, the, the letter was much more of a poke, uh, more or less friendly in nature, at all of the people who were coming up with a, a, a movement, a literary movement of the week or a literary genre of the week something punk, you know, and yeah. probably the original was uh, uh, cyberpunk, but pretty soon you had splatterpunk and you had some other punks and all sorts of 
And that really, I mean, I, I, I was more poking fun of the notion of let's take something and, and append, you know, punk to the end, uh, just to make it seem like there was something going on. Uh, but in retrospect, I think, uh, you know, when I was talking about, you know, we were doing things that we, we really hoped would irritate people, that in a lot of ways, uh, of, of all those genres, we, we were the ones who were most putting the punk into steampunk. Uh, that you know, it, it, it was something you know, sort of uh, subversive and, and, and inherently uh, uh, anarchic, and uh, that's um, you know, a all of this would have happened without that label being attached to it. It's too bad you couldn't have trademarked it. Well, you know, I actually had a discussion about that with an intellectual property lawyer. You know, somebody had, had yeah, yeah. I, I mean, we were talking about some other deal I was working on. And we got started talking about the notion of, well, you know, gee, you know, why didn't I patent or copyright the word steampunk? Because uh, you know, I can document that I created it. And I, I thought, you know, I wouldn't be a total jerk about this. I'd let anybody who was writing a book or something or having a convention, you know, use the word gratis, you know, even if it, I, I somehow got ownership of it. The only, the only thing I'd do is, you know, if somebody made a TV show where they had an episode, where they mentioned the word steampunk, then I could just, you know, have my lawyer fire off a letter saying that'll be five thousand dollars, please. You know, make out of AW Peter. I thought that would have been cool. So, uh, so uh, the lawyer was talking to him, and he was, we were very serious about that. And he said, "Well, okay, so you can document that you created the word, yes, and it's been in use since, and yes, and then the only other thing is that you've been making money from it ever since." And I said, "Damn, <laughs> uh, I knew I forgot something." Uh, so uh, of, of, the, of the three tests that I, I would have to pass to, you know, lay ownership in law to the to the to, uh, to the word, you know, that one failed. Uh, so it, it really is, you know, free as the wind for, for anybody to use. But uh, yeah, that was sort of just the creation of, of that label. I think it, it probably got a little more uh, currency from uh, Paul De Filippo doing uh, uh, the, his uh, the Steampunk trilogy. To, to, to the extent that I only really became aware of what was going on when a, uh, an article showed up in the New York Times talking about steampunk becoming a, a, a sort of subgenre in itself. And the, the uh, reporter who wrote the article said, you know, and the word comes from the title of all the clear books yeah. and steampunk. Really. Yeah, you know, and I actually wrote back to the reporter. I said, look, you know, uh, you're, the, you're the journal of record on this sort of thing. You know, you need to do a retraction. She never wrote back. <laughs> uh, but I got, I got an email from Paul, the police was saying, hey, I hope you're not mad at me. You know, that person, no, no, that's fine. Uh, but I think that helped. And also what helped was, while I was completely not paying any attention at all to what was going on with this, my wife was uh, sort of, you know, seeing what was going on and come across these mentions of, you know, people calling stuff steampunk and there being a growing movement and I just didn't pay attention to it. To, to her telling me this until it showed up again in the New York Times. Oh, you know. Yeah. I'd have been furious. Uh, she was. <laughs> uh, uh, and rightly so, and rightly so. Uh, and uh, so really, uh, all that time that this had been going on, uh, she had been, you know, sort of, you know, when any, anything would show up on the internet saying, you know, Paul the Filippo or somebody else, she would say, no, it's this letter to Locust Magazine, blah, 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 blah. And so, to her credit, she sort of kept the notion going around that uh, I had been the one who, who created the word. And now, I, I think it's, it's, you know, I, I hope it's not going on my tombstone, but I, <laughs> I, I do seem to get credit for it. Um, essentially, this all started off as a, a small kind of niche literary movement, um, but it's very much in vogue right now. Um, so I'm kind of curious as to what you make of the, um, the, the transition uh, between that starting point and what really has now become way beyond a literary movement, it's become a kind of cultural, or a, a, a cultural mission to something. I, 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 no, I, I just want to say, I hope it stays in vogue for at least another couple of years because I've got the sequel to uh, yeah. 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 coming out in 2013, so I, I hope everybody's still interested at least that much longer. Jim, your, your thoughts regarding what has what has happened in terms of the explosion of the ideas? I uh, love the fact that it exploded, and that you see steampunk and 
you know, all over the world. Um, makes me quite happy. I wish more people read it sometimes. <laughs> they uh, wear it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, I, I know it's, uh, at steampunk conventions, typically in a dealer's room, there's, a, there's one table selling books and 40 tables selling jewelry and costumes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the books are on how to make jewelry and costumes. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I have a grudge against that because I think that the stuff that the other dealers are selling, you know, the, the gizmos and the goodies, are, are great. I love it. Absolutely. But, uh, hmm. yeah, um, that's what I'd say. I like it. I'm happy about it. No. The whole world just starts dressing like, you know, wearing goggles. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting that it's, it's been about 20 years, uh, well, hell, more probably, since what I think are the two exactly steampunk novels. There are, of course, earlier stuff. Um, Michael Moorcock, uh, Harry Harrison, people were writing stuff that it certainly fits into the. Uh, sure. Well, people like Jules Verne, some of you may have heard of. Um, <laughs> but I think that the perfectly in the focus of what we now mean by steampunk novels are uh, Infernal Devices and Homunculus. Uh, those are exactly what we mean by it, with the instruments, the weird science, the, the crazy, as I always think of it, landmark type adventures. Um, and the other thing is because it's now gone beyond the London setting. Well, they, that's true. These days they call it a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting, I think, that the whole thing is still uh, linking back to these couple of 25-year-old books. Uh, I still think those are the purest examples of it. It's by all the millions that have been written since. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think that in, in, in a literary sense, that's, that's the most gratifying aspect of it, is that other people have found that there was so much more depth and possibility to just the little thing that, that Jim and I uh, carved out. Yeah. Uh, there was a fascinating young lady up at SteamCon in Seattle, a, 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 a young lady named uh, Jamie Go, uh, who's of uh, Malaysian descent. And uh, she was talking about um, uh, uh, an interest, uh, not just from herself, but a lot of other people, in uh, steampunk as sort of an anti-colonial literature that, that they that she, that you know essentially there were people writing about the Victorian experience in the colonies of that period, you know, far far away from from, from London, and uh, you know uh, you know uh, just taking it as a way of viewing the the the, the experience of colonized people uh, during that time and really doing some some kind of interesting stuff with it. Yeah, so. As a matter of fact, you think, how about, you know, Kipling? Oh, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Factor. You know, I don't think anybody's written, maybe, maybe she is aware of it. Maybe, yeah. Uh, uh, but I, I, I think, you know, from, from her viewpoint, Kipling would probably come across as a bit of a bad guy. He'd be on the wrong side. Yeah, he'd be on the wrong side. Yeah. But that overlap, the yeah. Raj. Yeah, know? absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, when, once you start thinking of, of, of what the Victorian world consisted of, yeah, you, you essentially have an empire that the sun never set on. Yeah. So yeah. It, it can be simply global. <laughs> anywhere on earth uh, you could write about, uh, you know. And so this is why I think we're getting some, some wild, wild west, uh, not, not, the, not, not the Will Smith movie, uh, but you know, uh, Victorian adventure set in America during essentially what we think of as the, the western period. How, how do you feel about the kind of intellectualization of what essentially started off as uh, poking fun at your own established good question? Yeah, well, God bless them. <laughs> you, know, you, you wonder, you wonder if, if, if they're doing something wonderful or they just didn't get the joke. It's like, you know, uh, yeah, they're finding the, the, these, these great literary and uh, intellectual depths and something and we're going, yeah, really guys, you're just sort of screwing around. I think you're supposed to say, yes it is. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm glad you perceived that uh, motif. And, uh, yeah, I think I I feel I had a lot to say about the human heart and conflict with itself. <laughs> in, uh, at the University of Wyoming, in the late 1990s, I think, there was a, uh, a steampunk convention, or not a convention, but a um, symposium put up on by the Department of uh, Utopian and Dystopian Studies. And um, they... There's a department. <laughs> <laughs> They were, uh, the whole thing actually featured our books. I was invited to attend. There was a, a day-long thing 
Um, they, they wanted me to talk about steampunk as revisionist history. Yeah, sure. Which I, I thought, gee, that's great. I thought, okay, to what extent is my work revisionist history? Mm -hmm. I, I know very little about history. What I do know, I, I stole from, from Dickens and uh, a number of other writers at the time. And so my London was purely imaginary in the, in the first place. And not only that, but it was translated through the mind of this kid who grew up in Anaheim, California, you know. Lord knows what the result is, but if that constitutes revisionist history, then, and it's worth uh, a symposium, I'm, I'm just all for it. They, they actually um, offered to, to give me money to come out to, which was good because we had no money at the time. And um, I remember them offering something like 32 billion lira or something. And I thought, okay, that'll, that'll be great. Uh, Vicky and I can, can fly. It turned out to be about $30. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I never, I never got to go to the symposium. They had, they had to carry on without any of us, which seems... Also, any good. revision of history we do is accidental. That's because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I meant that to be incorrect. Uh, that was an error. That was a revision. Yeah, that was not a mistake. What about the notion of uh, finding yourselves as... Uh, you know, kind of founding father, old statesman characters. I was, uh, some people may be familiar with an exhibition in London recently about the uh, fantastic exhibition at Visual Library about the history of science fiction, stretching all the way back to you know, the very first, uh, very first texts. Um, and there's a little exhibition there featuring books, the famous books by these gentlemen. How, are you now museum pieces? I feel yeah. <laughs> like a museum piece. <laughs> Uh, it, it, in some ways, it's very gratifying, but it's also a little intimidating. You know, I, I haven't touched anything to, to, to deal with it for, you know, like 10, 15 years or something. And then I, I got convinced to, to finally do the, you know, the, the sequel to Infernal Devices. And I started looking around at all the other steampunk writers who had come along, and I thought, damn, the competition is fierce. Uh, it, 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 this was much less intimidating to do when there weren't, yeah. when there wasn't anybody doing just it. Just sitting around O'Hara is... But, but some of these, these new people are scarily good. And, and I, I really didn't need the competition. Uh, you know, so, so I'm hoping that people will go, well, it's not as good as these recent people, but let's give them a break because after all, he's old. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, if, if museum piece, you know, connotation gets me a little bit of a, of a pass from people, then you know, I'll take whatever I can. And in fact, um, just touching upon the, the, the forthcoming novel, it, so you're, you're all working on, or have worked on new steampunk books, um, kind of reviving yourselves. Um, but it's just a little opportunity to, to talk. Yes. Oh, right. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, each of the projects that you're working on. Uh, but Jim, maybe you can go first. All right. Well, I'm briefly. I, exactly the same thing happened to me. Fifteen years went by, I didn't write any steampunk, and then Bill Schaefer at Subterranean Press uh, started suggested that I that I write something steampunky, and um, so I thought I would, and I did, and I discovered that I still very much enjoyed writing it, which was which was very nice because otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. And in fact, it's a, it's a, as much fun today as it was as it ever was. Currently, I'm writing a. Um, uh, steampunk novel um, for Titan Books um, that I have, uh, I think it's certainly the best of the steampunk novels that I've, that I've written. Um, I've got uh, every volume of Mayhew out of my desk as we speak, and um, yeah, so it feels like, you know, 1976 again. <laughs> In some ways, except for I wasn't quite as much of a museum piece in that. <laughs> Tim, what about your project? Uh, well, I just finished a book which is going to be published in March, um, which does take place in Victorian London. Uh, there's no science in it, no steam. Uh, and I mainly wrote it because I was, just for entertainment, reading about uh, Dante Gabriel Rossetti and his sister Christina, and came across some real peculiar behavior. Uh, on their parts. If some of you are nodding, you know about what old Dante Gabriel did. Um, what he did is he, when his wife killed herself, he, he took his poetry notebook and put it in her coffin and was buried with her. 
And some years later, a poet, uh, publisher said to him, uh, if you had a collection of poetry, we could publish it. And he said, yeah, give me a couple days. <laughs> and, he it up. Uh, and I thought, cool. Uh, that's, the sort of, that's the sort of hook you can build something up. And, um, but it's supernatural. It's, it's not any kind of science fiction. It's entirely, you know, magic and, and stuff like that. But it does take place in Victoria and London. And so maybe if they put a big dirigible on the cover, <laughs> Uh, I might be able to cash in on this. Uh, it, it'll be fraud, but again, I'm trusting all of you not to pass that on. <laughs> what about the sequel to Infinity Devices? Uh, it's called Phoenix Schemes. It should be out from a uh, tour in 2013. I'm just finishing it up uh, uh, right now. And it is sort of, in some ways, it's a sequel. Well, it is a sequel to uh, um, Infernal Devices, but it does not continue directly afterwards from the events of, of the first book. Uh, it's very much something where just like I'm many years later writing it, the events that happen in it are many years after the events of uh, Infernal Vices, but it centers around uh, the same protagonist, uh, the, the guy named George Dower, and uh, more of his uh, involvement with uh, the crazy machines that were invented by his father and different you know, uh, conspiracies and devices, and I think at, at, at one point I blew up the Houses of Parliament, and, and, and you think you think you may have? <laughs> I think I may have. <laughs> that was you. Yeah, yeah. And so, in terms of revisionist history, yeah, I mean, obviously you know, we're, we're revising like mad here, and um, it 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 was in some ways both congenial and awkward because uh, the the sort of, you know it's told in the first person by by this uh, fellow. And it naturally speaks in sort of a, you know, in, in a Victorian uh, manner. And it, it's oddly easy for me to construct sentences like that. And it gives you this tremendous ability to, to use a, a pre-Hemingway vocabulary uh, you're, you're, and, and, and uh, a way of, of building sentences and phrases. Um, so you're, you're, you're free to, to uh, Right in an enormously uh, complicated uh, way, but you know, with, with great freedom comes great responsibility. You wind up and you've got a sentence covering an entire uh, page, and you probably figure you should maybe dial it back a little bit. And uh, so in that way, it, it was very con congenial. And, uh, awkward in the sense that you know, I, I was trying to do two other projects at the same time, and you know, juggling them back and forth. One was a, a project for St. Martin's that centered around some. Uh, previously untranslated Grimm's fairy tales sort of um, worked into a mixed martial arts thing, you know. I didn't like it. It was kind of a That old game. Yeah, that old game. <laughs> yeah, so there's a lot of like clunking people over the, the top of the head and stuff with uh, various fights and things. Okay. And, 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 and at the same time, I also got started doing another project which was totally a, a, a contemporary thriller thing uh, and that went very well but I, I found myself switching uh, gears like three or four times a day trying to trying to keep all these things you know simmering in their in their different pots and uh, I, I think it was, it was my wife who pointed out that I, I had at certain points in my contemporary thriller thing I had the person talking you know, as if she were, you know, you know, from from you know Queen Victoria's age. And so I said, well, yeah, I'll fix that. Don't worry. About that. That's why we, you know, we have word processors now. Um, we are down to the last ten minutes, so I'm going to throw open for questions. John, you were first over there. Thanks to Mr. Dieter. Thanks to Mr. Dieter, but can we get the, the names of the new works from the other two authors? Tim, the new new, new novel is uh, the name of it is uh, Hide Me Among the Graves which is a line from a, a poem written by the suicide wife. And it's going to be from Harper Collins. <coughs> and Tim? Jim. 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 Well, Jim, sorry. I think I've um, met <laughs> My book is uh, currently titled The Aylesford Skull. And uh, as I said, it was, it's due out from Titan. OK, so what? loud as you can, please. Absolutely, not a problem. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, uh, that there are certain flavors of steampunk depending on what locations 
that you are with conventions in parts of the country and so forth. Have you guys noticed that as well, that like to the West Coast you're noticing more of a weird Western sort of flavor and East Coast more Victorian or anything like that? No, actually, I haven't. No. <laughs> I like the idea. Yeah, yeah no, the, the idea sounds fine. I, uh, I guess I, you may, maybe I just, I've just only recently been to the one steam con thing up in yeah. Seattle. So yeah, right? we've all been to that one. Yeah, yeah, so maybe <laughs> I, if I went back east, I, I, I would see it. So. I like the idea, you know, I hate Seattle steampunk, but I love, you know, uh, Charleston yeah. steampunk. Yeah. <laughs> There was an area of um, Victorian England that actually did use these kind of fantastic devices that admire <coughs> expertise, that of magicians. Uh, the study of Robert Houdin and the automata, the like Antonio Diavolo. Did you gentlemen get in, look into that at all when you worked on it? I can say this to you. Kevin. Yeah, I, I, I right. used a little bit of that in uh, infernal devices. Uh, that there, there's some uh, mechanical figures that are like, you know, those uh, actual creations that existed. Some of those were Swiss and some were French. And uh, yeah, they, they were incredibly detailed. And uh, it, the, the ones, you know, there, I, I think there are some museum exhibits where they actually have the, the, the uh, costumes taken off the devices and you can see all the gearing and stuff inside. And to think that every one of those things was done essentially by gears and cogs and wheels and, and things like that, no solenoids, no little motors, nothing like that. Uh, incredible, I mean, that, that's a level of craftsmanship that nowadays we see maybe with some very fine uh, uh, watches, you know, some, of the, some of the hand built, you know, fabulously expensive watches, uh, to do that kind of thing where they could have an incredible range of motion and an incredible range of programmable motion, yeah. So, I mean, they, 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 they could have a mechanical flute player play different tunes uh, by, by programming it in different ways. Uh, so, the, the, the creativity of those people was uh, astonishing. Yeah. A uh, couple more, we've got time for a couple more questions. Uh, Shout, scream. Ginger. Ginger. Oh. Uh, actually, the gentleman behind me, Ginger. Could we get the name of that uh, research manual again? The, uh, the, the major. Uh, London Labor and the London Poor, and then the other ones the London Poor. So Labor. actually they're, they're in print in two kind of uh, very generous selections called uh, London Underworld, uh, London Underground and uh, Underworld, and the other one was, 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 is... Well, if you look up Henry Mayhew, yeah. Uh, you know, go to ABE Books and look for Henry Mayhew. And yeah. I, yeah, I just got the labor, uh, London Labor of the London Poor in a, in a trade paperback from ABE Books. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and every, every 10 pages is material for a novel. Yeah. And, 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 and if you're like Googling Henry Mayhew, I mean, yeah, you're basically going to find this stuff. And, and, and it will be the stuff you're looking for. He didn't do anything else but that stuff, really. In fact, if you read it, you'll be able to say, ah, there's G, where Jeter ripped it yeah. off. Here's where Powers ripped it off. Here's where Blaylock ripped it off. Yeah, so, Here's so, a paragraph that I'm touched. Yeah, yeah. So, so <laughs> that's the one to use. Yeah. <coughs> it's probably the real reason I thought the whole idea of copyright work is, you know, God knows if, if there's an estate of Henry Mayhew, we're in big trouble. <laughs> uh, Jim, did you have a question? I missed the first few minutes, so if you started by saying, uh, answering this question, excuse me. Uh, KW, you're obviously keeping up because you were talking about the competition out there. Who's writing now that, that uh, you're reading, that you would recommend, that you would like to kill? I mean, <laughs> uh, if, 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 if Team Morris and Philippa Valentine vanished from the face of the earth, that would relieve me uh, a great deal. <laughs> they're, they're, they're wonderful people. I, I correspond with them. They're, they're, they're great people, great writers. Uh, they're they're scarily good. Uh, like I said, if, if all of a sudden you know we, we we revised them out of literary history, it would take a lot of the pressure off. But, but definitely uh, T. Morris and uh, Philippa Valentine. Jim, 
Uh, I guess the most recent book I read was uh, Levine Pittard's uh, book map, which was, which was brilliant. Yeah. And I said, that was a, another one, competition I don't need. Yeah, 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 yeah. I prefer not to look. You know, I, 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 what, 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 we, what we really want is a senior division. Uh, <laughs> Where, where you know you get you get to tee off much much closer to the pin, yeah. you know, and, 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 and the young punks can you know you know tee off from, from the actual green. That's right. Yeah, because we deserve it. I, I actually don't read science fiction fantasy much, um, but I've noticed that some of the covers look awfully good. <laughs> uh, Jay Lake has some covers that I'm very jealous of. But since I don't read it, I'm free to imagine that um, that nobody has come near to uh, matching us. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to—I don't want to actually read anything and dispel it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are out of time. I'm very sorry to say.